Well, I began my research on the Longfellow area in May of last year, which grew out of my previous study of the adjacent East Iowa City area. The Longfellow neighborhood has a very rich history. My goal here is to discuss some of the more notable points of interest, at least in my opinion, and to perhaps reveal some little known information about Longfellow. Here's a look at the entire area that is encompassed by the Longfellow Neighborhood Association. Neighborhood associations began in Iowa City in 1992, I think. There are 34 such associations by my count, but they don't exist in all parts of the city. The Longfellow Association appears to be a very active one, and it issues a newsletter on a frequent basis, one called the Longview, although I haven't seen evidence of them lately. I'll have to check on that. Here are the streets that mark the periphery of the area. And for additional reference, here are some of the streets within the area. Now let's have a look at the development of this area. What I'm about to show you is very detailed, but there might be some names that will be of significance as we make our way through the neighborhood. Here is a progression of additions to Iowa City over the years, the ones which are in this Longfellow neighborhood. We have the P.J. Regan, his first edition. Regan owned a nursery. And here's Oaks, his first edition. Oaks was a man who was to come to Iowa City in the mid-1800s and become a brickmaker. Another Regan edition. Then the O.S. Kelly Company bought some land on which they built a factory in 1899. Oaks' is second edition. And then the Rundle edition, which came in 1908, including the Rundle farmhouse that no longer stands. The Swisher edition, the Swisher name is associated also with the town of Swisher, Iowa. The family name came from, the name came from the family. Then there was a proposal of annexation in early 1910, which was quite significant. This was the boundary of Iowa City in March of 1910. And these were the outlining streets. You can see it was much smaller than it is today. And this was the proposed area that would be annexed. So they would go from that in red to this in the kind of blue color. It would almost double the size of Iowa City in its area. It would take in East Iowa City, which was formed in 1899, the Rundle edition from 1908, the Manville edition, we know as Manville Heights, and the Chautauqua area, where they held Chautauquas. The election results showed that it was passed by a narrow margin. People both within the city and in the county were allowed to vote, and it didn't pass by a wide margin, but the city was then doubled in area. Here is a, a quite a busy slide that shows a lot of these areas, including the Cauldron Division. And here's a very busy slide that tries to show you all of the additions. And it kind of shows you how something doesn't come about all at once. These were all added over long periods of time. We'll begin our tour in the northeast corner of the area where College Street crosses Brawlston Creek. Ahead, at the corner on the left, is the large Angerer residence. We'll now turn on the Muscatine Avenue, heading southeast. We take note of two metal sculptures, including a large one with a person before a piano. It is named El Compositor and is not meant to depict a specific person. Then as we look over on the right, just a bit down the street, we see the Randy Turchill Law Firm building. This building once housed at least three neighborhood grocery stores, including Frank Bath, Gump's, and Ralston's. Interestingly, it's one of three such one-time groceries, all within a very short distance of each other. Why were there so many small groceries, one might ask? Why were they so close together? That was common in the old days, and also the fact that this was the main U.S. Highway 6 before the so-called bypass was built would answer to the fact that it was quite a busy area. 
Now you know about these little mo cute little Moffat cottages. Some people think that these were the only Moffats in town, but there were like over a hundred Moffat homes in town, I think, including Coralville. Howard Moffat, let's go down and just show you a couple more views here. Howard Moffat built, like I said, quite a bunch of them in the 1920s, 30s, and up into the 40s. He was trained actually, I think he got a degree in political science from the University of Iowa. He had no formal training in construction or, or business. Yeah, he did get a degree in political science. He formed an auto parts business at first with a partner, Ray Blakesley. Anyone familiar with that name? And later they began building the houses. And they were all built as rentals, weren't they, Wally? I, I, I think. was told during, during the war there was rent control. Yes, so and he unloaded them, them all, sold them all. sell them for a low down payment. And yes. And people would just pay him so much and then the next guy would come along and do yep. the same thing. He used some interesting materials in the building, as you might have heard. <laughs> Such things as salvaged lumber, things from a local dump site, why not? Salvaged sections of streetcar track, bridge planks, sawdust for insulation, and even chair backs. And there's more than that I'll show you too, or talk about. He often bartered for goods and services. His nephew was the late Bruce Glasgow. Really? Of Glasgow, Duncan Matheson of Glasgow, and Bruce owned with, he was in business with uh, uh, no, I mean, uh, oh, um, Boyd. Boyd. Boyd, yeah, Boyd, Rummelhart. Boyd and Rummelhart, yeah. But anyway, he worked on the construction crew for a while, Bruce Glasgow. So like you said, we, they unloaded these houses, selling them on contract. 78 of them were sold on contract. Uh, and a person named Bill, I read a letter that he sent to um, Mary at the Historical Society, Mary Bennett. And he said in there, when remodeling a Moffat, there is always some strange incident. <laughs> and one incident involved the movement of a small piano into a Moffat house, and the piano sank into the floor. <laughs> but it did not fall into the basement. It was held up by the railroad spurs that Moffat used to support as support beams. And a second interesting incident was involving a contractor who was remodeling. He took the plaster from a wall expecting to find the normal wood lath underneath. Instead, he found a series of wooden toilet seats that were attached to the studs, <laughs> and they were used for wood lath. Well, Moffat moved to Texas in 1943, but still built a few homes at each year until 1949. And one, more than one owner has told me that there's not one square corner in the rooms of their Moffats. I think over 100 maybe, yeah. Were a lot of them torn down? No, I don't think so. So they're all still here? Well, I think most of them are. Do you know anything about that, Gerald? Most of them are there. And there was a his tour of historic homes a weekend or two ago, and a lot of Moffats were part of that, I know. I didn't go on it, but you did, didn't you, Jan uh, Janet? Karen. Is there a Moffat map? I don't know. It might be kind of nice to... There are quite a few in the Rundle edition. Yeah. Yeah. There are a number of them there. Can you go online and see the Moffat map? I don't think you can. There's an article in Palimpsest. Uh, oh, in the Palimpsest? Palimpsest? Yeah, I, I read that article. That's where I learned about Bruce Glasgow and others, yes. A Palimpsest article, or Palimpsest article. Yeah. That strange named magazine that is under a different name now. The, you know Seton's Market, of course. Most of you remember Seton's. It went out of business in 1996. But did you know that it included at least five other grocery concerns before that? Including Bonhams, Palmers, Hunters, Hart Vixens, and Cunninghams. But the Seton's family had it for the longest run. Kind of in meat, I think. Yeah, that's why they yeah. kept going. People really liked it. Well, they supplied restaurants and probably fraternities. But then the, there were restrictions that clamped down, government restrictions, like uh, we don't like your sawdust on the floor anymore, soaking up blood and stuff like that, probably. But anyway, they did clamp down. There's even a rumor, maybe more than that, that high V had something to do with maybe edging such places out. I don't know no. about that. No. <laughs> no. Now here, this is a, it, this historical sign is just outside of Seton's. It's one of seven such signs 
and the Longfellow neighborhood that all come out of one project. A man named Tim Whitesell and Will Thompson, if you know the names, were the persons responsible for the research and artwork. Linda Leidiger was the writer and copy editor. You remember Linda, Hal? She was in the class that we just had on the inventions. To borrow from the rhetoric on the side, small neighborhood grocery stores flourished during the first half of the 20th century before the widespread introduction of the larger supermarkets. The advent of 24-hour convenience stores put an additional crimp on the business of small grocery stores. Seaton's lost restaurant customers who accounted for 40% of their sales due to a scare, this is not on the sign, that the Federal Meat Inspection Act would restrict sales to restaurants. Seaton's took over the store in 1956, at which time there were as many as 32 family-owned groceries. Maybe that is on the sign, I don't know. During the 1930s and 40s, the Iowa City directories listed as many as 45, even up to 50 grocery stores at one time. Well, now it's an antique shop, and I get a kick out of their sign. Some days we're not here at all, but lately we have been here about all the time, except when we are somewhere else. <laughs> and it's never open. It's virtually never, at least when I go by. It's owned by the Watts family. Do you know the Watts? Yeah, I think. Now if we go down Muscatine, we're passing through Court Street and the Muscatine intersection. Legend has it that Robert Ralston, one of the Iowa City founders, had his name attached to the creek because he showed up late for a meeting. That's what... I think Weber relates. That's an interesting house with those slanted windows. Do you suppose they did that for glare? Or just just a design element, perhaps? Pardon? Oh, I don't think so. It looks too modern, doesn't it? Now, if we go down a little farther, we come to the Rundle Street intersection. I, I heard there was a movement to narrow the street in the left. That's right. It, there certainly was. There was a railroad track, part of the Iowa City Streetcar Company. Does everyone realize that that's why it's so wide? We'll talk about that more in a little bit. And there's the Watts, the former Watts grocery that's similarly an antique shop now. So see, it was also white books, and they pump gas there too, probably to the right of the screen where that little asphalt lot is there. Yeah, and gas station, right, okay. Now we're going down a little farther. We're at now the corner of 7th Avenue. Looking down 7th Avenue there, we'll make our way down 7th Avenue. Here we come to one or two Moffats. They have a lot of similar characteristics with some of the stonework and the chimneys or chimbleys, like they said in the musical Oklahoma. Um, why are the lots, why are the houses closer together on the right side of the street in Rundle than they are on the left side in East Iowa City? Because the lots were narrower. <laughs> <laughs> but, but they did indeed have narrower lots in the Longfellow area, in the Rundle area, which is part of it. Did so, the street divide two different developments then? Say again, please. Did the street divide two different developments Yes, then? yes. East Iowa City ended at 7th Avenue and apparently didn't go over to the west side when that was formed. Now, if you look at this, this is said to be chair backs that, that uh, were used by Moffat as a design element, or parts of chair backs. 27 chair backs were used, and 25 more at the back of the house. Now as we go down 7th Avenue, we're getting down toward the railroad tracks, we see a really nicely kept stucco home, a number of craftsmen style houses down there. Now here's one that's even smaller than your rental, Wally. It's 400, it looks like a neat little place, but isn't that cute? It's 440 square feet, smaller than most double garages. Now we're gonna head down Jackson Street. And we're, we'll turn west on Jackson. On the left, we see the Littrell House at the corner of Dearborn. That was associated with the chicken hatchery or egg chicken hatchery. Yeah, yeah. 
it burned down the building that that housed the chicken hatchery burned down last year or maybe sure, year before. Last, maybe two years ago yeah maybe two years ago you can see it being built there and let's turn and just just take a look down or north on Dearborn really lovely street with canoping trees and so as there was a Rundle field here at one time has anyone heard of that Iowa City had a short-lived semi-professional baseball team known as the Gold Sox <laughs> and later the Ramblers I think played there that's about the area that it encompassed that would be is that Jackson and Sheridan seventh over to Rundle that was a baseball field it lasted just a couple years and they may have created that partially as a promotion for home lots in the Rundle division there so here's the building now completed that's it's a dental laboratory and there's an alley that's just west of it that goes to the south here off of Jackson and let's take a look down at the bot or the south end of that and here we see this structure does anyone know what that's called the tunnel of love did you say <laughs> um, anyone know what name has been ascribed to this dead man's cave You say drains? Yes, I th we think it was established as a drainage ditch kind yeah, of a thing. Right. Now, do you suppose this could have been built as early as 1855? Yeah. That's when the railroad was put through. Oh, okay. It's pretty fascinating. It's a neat, neat old structure. I've taken people down to show them. It has that kind of keystone kind of a... Was there ever a dead man in there? I heard that someone may have been shot there, or maybe it collapsed. Well, it wouldn't have collapsed and killed somebody, but no. who knows why? I, no, nothing that substantiates it. This is on the south end of it, the entrance to it. You can get that off of what is the street there? Maybe I wrote it down. I can't remember. That's comes off of of um, oh golly, whatever. It doesn't matter. <laughs> No, as we continue west on Jackson Avenue, we come to Rundle. As we travel north, we see the street is quite narrow, but as it reach as we reach Sheridan Avenue, that's the wide part where the what would you call it? The trolley car would be one way of saying it came down there. So here's the Rundle edition. See it's the, the far eastern portion of the Longfellow area. It came about in 1908 from the Rundle Farm. And the developers and promoters promised a streetcar line from the heart of the downtown to the vicinity of Rundle Street and Sheridan Avenue. This would be built, they said, if enough lots were purchased from the Rundle Land Improvement Company. A prime mover of the development was a Mr. Maggard. You know Maggard Street? That's nearby. And Maggard was prominent with the O.S. Kelly factory that will show you here that was built where the that was the ADS yeah. factory building so this was the way the streetcar ran in black there from downtown coming down Rundle and perhaps over a little bit toward the factory this was the complete streetcar system there were five lines by the time everything was built it was all electric. Yes. Apparently, the first streetcar line did not originally run down the center of Rundle, but instead angled like this. I think it ran from Rundle more to King up Wellington Street. That's correct. <laughs> but I'm talking about this part right here. This angled instead of coming down Rundle at first, we think, from looking at some old maps. The streetcars lasted till probably about 1930. How so, long did that, uh, pardon? Well, that trolley ride last. How long did it last? How long? We think it went out around 1930 or shortly after. Where did it start, John? 19. 
was it 10? 1910. Yeah, it says right there. Yeah, it was only about a 20 year run. Why would it have been so short? What happened to it? We got cars. We got cars. And, and also we had what we call go anywhere buses. And so with a bus that could go an infinite number of places, why would you want five little discrete lines like that? So it didn't last very long. See, it came in kind of late to Iowa City in 1910. There were streetcars in Des Moines much before that in other parts of the country, probably 1890 or something like that. So we got kind of a late start, you might say. When? Were the streets paved? Which? Uh, in, in 1930. Oh, I think so, yeah. yeah. Any of those were. The first ones were paved in around 1895, I think, with bricks. I think that was about the first of it. Okay, here we have, now we're coming to Ralston Creek on Sheridan Avenue. I'm going to spend some time talking about this creek because it's played a big part in the history of this area and other parts of Iowa City. So I'll get a little bit off topic of this neighborhood and part here. The Iowa Interstate Railroad owns that portion of the creek down there. It runs right along, that's near Dead Man's Cave. After the creek crosses, Sheridan Avenue runs north between Rundle and Grant, where there looks like there was an alley at one time Although this is a current map from the city, but there's no alley that goes through there. There maybe was or was projected to be before the, because I'll show you what happened to the creek. The creek was changed, its course was changed. Originally the creek bowed out, you see the difference, it bowed out to the east wow. like that. They straightened it out. The question is why did they straighten it out? There's a picture of it from a 19... 08 plat of the Rundell edition. I looked into this study from this engineering club. Well, I wonder if, well, Weber wrote that the developers changed it after they found it hard to sell the lots in the boat out area because the creek flooded frequently there. However, as pointed out in the engineering study, in so doing, the low spot was left to the east of the rechanneled creek. Mm -hmm where the water would flow to during flood events. I wonder if they just wanted a straight streetcar run so they didn't have to build two bridges over the creek. That's be kind of interesting to find out. In any event, it's caused a lot of floods and sewer backups. This I took just last summer. You're kidding, where is that? This is, uh, this is Rundle Street, I think, here. Yes. This, um, I should have, well here, let me read you what I had for this slide here. The more notable 20th century floods occurred in June of 1941, September of 42, June of 62, and July of 72. The Rundle Street area seemed to be the place that was hit the hardest. Over most of the 20th century, the city argued for flood control. Often the recommended remedies, such as the placement of dams, were considered too costly. Well, what happened in the 1980s? They placed some dams, we'll talk about. It took quite a while. The city addressed the issues of trash and vegetation removal, creek bed straightening, widening and deepening. That They took action to some degree in, in those things. In addition, troublesome bridges like this one on Center Street were rebuilt for better water flow. To add insult to injury this, in this troublesome creek, residents often dumped refuse mm -hmm. Refuse appliances, sewage was emptied, raw sewage was emptied into it. Commonplace in the old days. This is one of our dams on Scott Boulevard, 1983. It was built by Rita's Ranch Dog Park. And here, that same day I took that other picture, is the water that backed up there. Just from Ralston Creek's one branch, which is relatively short, but drains quite a bit of countryside east of there. And here's the Hickory Hill Park Dam. Have you, many of you have seen this. Remember they built that in the 80s also. Well, that, that picture I showed you here, this occurred on June 30th after about one and a half inches of rain had fallen in two hours. When done, three and a half fell within a six hour period, but that's I wonder if we didn't get some backing up recently, I don't know. And then 
Okay, the other thing that has lessened the burden on the creek is the creation of stormwater retention areas. This is on Scott Boulevard by Regency Heights Apartments. There's a big bowl there and pipes that come out from draining neighborhood streets. So that acts as a area that soaks in and relieves the burden on the creek. Here's a picture of the creek system that I outlined in blue with the two dams and showing the former location of the creek in black there. I mentioned the rebuilding of the bridge at Center Street. The creek's higher than the area to the east, so a lift station is in place to dump water up and into the creek through these pipes. They were installed in 1981, and I wish I'd gotten a picture of when it was really coming out of there. The, the heavy metal lid was just straight out with the amount of water that was flowing out of there. The smaller pump can handle 950 gallons per minute, whereas the larger can handle 10,000 gallons per minute. To put things into perspective, how many gallons of water do you suppose are present from one inch of rain and just one acre of land? 300,000 gallons is what I've read. Yeah, in spite of all the measures we've taken to tame Ralston Creek, we still face some flood flooding issues from time to time. Remember the sandbagging that was recently done by the new pie. Any of you experienced any sewer or flooding problems in Rundle? Well, there's only, only one person or two from Rundle in here, but you haven't had any problems. Okay, here are some views of that rain again that I showed you before with that three and a half inches after six hours. So Rundle Street, Oh, you, get, you can drive easily right across center, the Center Avenue Bridge from the west. Yeah, from the west. Oh, yeah. Do you have Gibson's? Pardon? Do you have Gibson's? Uh, yeah. Didn't need them, but they're looking north. Or wait, e looking east across Rundle Street down Center Avenue. Okay. But from the west, I could get there just fine. So they must still have this happen from time to time. Is that a taxi down the street? I think it is, yeah. Yeah, that's a taxi. Yeah. Well, crossing Rundle, or Ralston Creek now, finally, on the Sheridan, we come to a newer development. You know about this newer development here? It has a name and a trail. Longfellow Court or something. Why is this sign in blue? I know. Through hard experience. Yes. That means that's a private street. It's yes. It's not maintained. Yeah, or it's private. Not maintained by the city. city. Yeah. Oh, really? You see them around different places, like Memler Court off of Rochester. Uh, Court Street a, Place. Yeah. Also Melrose. There's a problem street. Quite a few. This is an aerial view of the development. I thought it was kind of interesting. This is the peninsular development where they have houses that are made to kind of look like the old time houses and it seemed like they would have blended in a little better with the Longfellow neighborhood had they done something like that. It's kind of strange. I think the middle street is a city maintained street, but the east and west aren't. Could be. But it's kind of, Tom, seems goofy. Uh, Marcy and I found out something rather interesting about creeks in Iowa City, which I, I mean, I came from Nebraska and all waterways in Nebraska are controlled by state. In Iowa City, the owners of 85 to 90 percent of the creeks in Iowa City are controlled by the owners. The city has no right to step foot on that property. Uh. So we wanted to mitigate because we were getting a lot of, we were starting to lose trees. And they said, uh, we can't help you. We have, so we actually forked out the money and had it done. So They've had cleanup days in Longfellow where people have gone through and helped yeah. remove debris. And they hired, I think, Carol Chaddock donated some time one time along that area by this new development when they put some embankment stuff in there. And some other company, I think, might have donated. That's right, it's got to be done by the people. Many of you remember the big factory, the ADS factory. It was originally the Western Kelly Manufacturing Company. O.S. Kelly, built in 1899, and it produced 
small gas engines and farm equipment, different things. It didn't stay that too long until about 1912. Various other things went through there, used the factory over the years. This little building, I guess, is original building that was called the Wayhouse. Have any of you seen this? It's on, it's off of the westernmost street along that new subdivision to the south of Sheridan. And you can see the scale that was used there, still in place. And who uses this now? Anybody know? Heard of the Craft Guild of Iowa City? Oh, yeah. That's what they use. It, it was formed in 1939 by a group of Iowa City ladies to create craft items for materials both found and salvaged and then sell them in order to benefit the community. I guess they still have an active group. And here's the famous pedestrian tunnel that they put. I guess they literally pushed under there with something, that, but it cost like hundreds of thousands. Of, it was a massive amount of money, it seems like. Now we're going west on Sheridan. Well, I spent a lot of money. Like, I heard maybe three hundred thousand dollars to put this in, but where is it? It's it's right on the east southeast edge of that new de newer development that was built in the nineties, that sure. goes under the track. So over now you have a shortcut there. as a pedestrian or biker to get over to uh, Procter and Gamble. Yeah, Gamble what's the road right there, Kirkwood? Kirkwood. Yeah. Oh. Lower Muscatine. There's a church right on that. Corner. Yes. So we'll move westward on Sheridan. An area nearby here was used as a, a stage, a st I got ahead of myself only, used as a staging grounds for troops to, and I think I have that coming up here as Camp Pope, but I entered, I entered, posed a little picture here because we're just gonna go down Grant Street for a moment at Wally's request here. One of my frequent attendees, Wally Copsa, years ago bought this little house that's, what, 500 square feet? 528 square feet. 528, it was brown at that time. It's become kind of overgrown. He's had a renter there for quite some time. Wally's here. And when Wally's boy was maybe eight, nine years old, they drove by and Wally told his son that he, this is a new house of theirs and he said, you don't mean to tell me you bought this little brown dump, Dad. <laughs> so he remembers that little th story, of course, to this day. There's Camp Pope, and this is about the area delineated by Camp Pope that prepared soldiers for the Civil War. I imagine a lot or most got on the railroad tracks right nearby there and went off to war. Remember, the railroad was built in 18, the very end of 1855, beginning of 1856, it became operational. It only went to the east at that time. It only, it took, um, oh, what was it, five years at least to get to Oxford, five or 10 years later, I can't remember. We were at the end of the line, so it was a, a major step to have that railroad brought to Iowa City at the end of 1855. Now we'll, we'll head over to Summit Street. And if we go down to the very bottom of Summit Street by the railroad tracks and, and look north. Do you remember when the Summit Street Bridge was rebuilt? Yeah. It was, it opened in January of 2000, replacing a 70 year old bridge. And really Summit's quite an arterial street, isn't it? Yeah. Probably much to the chagrin of some of the residents here. The, the residents were probably quite happy for the seven or eight months of construction. Irving Weber told the story of a lady who brought down a hot rodder by the name of Johnny in the 1920s when he was using Summit Street as a racetrack. She stood in the middle of the street violently waving her broom, bringing the lad to a stop. And why did we name it Summit Street? Probably because it was up at the top of the, of the city. The elevation was, or is 728 feet, whereas the Iowa River drops almost 100 feet go all the way down to the west. And here's a plaque that commemorates the coming of the railroad and, does, and it talks about it coming, it doesn't specifically say, well it should, yes. The story has it that it arrived just before the stroke of midnight in 1855. Our local historian Bob Hibbs thinks that's kind of a fable 
but I can't find anything that really discounts that. Yeah, the, the townspeople turned down health. They built bonfires for light, and it was bitterly cold. And then what happened? The, the locomotive came to a grinding halt. And so they had to use pinch bars to edge it along and, and arrive just in the nick of time. That's the story, anyway. But now, as we. It was done, it was done to uh, win some kind of a prize. Yes, it was. There was a $50,000 prize. Yeah. Pardon? Where the station is now. Well, it used to be the, where the freight station is, it used to be the main station. Yeah, the main station was on Johnson Street, yeah. and now it's on Wright, yeah. Wright Street, yeah. yes. But, but A little bit to the east. The, the, yeah. the agreement was the tracks had to reach the station. I think you're right, yes. Now. Yes, that's right. The, the Johnson Street station, yep. So as we go north on Summit, we see that there's some, some newer houses there out of the character of what most of Summit Street is. A Mr. Henry Strom, or Strom, Strom I suppose, S-T-R-O-H-M, owned a sizable parcel of land west of Summit Street where he had a nursery for almost 40 years, I think. So that's uh, part of that. This, does, has anyone used the deluxe bakery? It's, it was, again, once a grocery store, at least three different grocery stores. Someone was, was someone shot dead outside of that grocery yeah, store? It was O'Rourke. Oh, Wally, I'm glad we scooped you on that. I like that because you know a lot of this history. But on the same side of the street, a little bit north, there was said to have been a grocery an address I couldn't find, whether it was maybe in the barn in the back or it was torn down. It doesn't seem likely it was torn down because these are older homes right here. A little bit of a mystery. And another grocery store that I couldn't find an address for. Not surprising that there'd be a lot of little grocery stores. Of course, most of Summit Street is made up of these palatial <laughs> estates. It's kind of mansion. I don't know. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. You think that's located? Most of the area that's in Longfellow falls under the category of either an historic district or a conservation district. So any proposed work or changes to the exterior of the building, they don't care about the insides, I guess, must be reviewed by a commission in Iowa City, and many restrictions are in place. Kind of been a double-edged sword for a lot of people. On the one hand, the preservation of existing architecture is nice, but for some, it's a place of economic hardship. Say they replace a window, and they have to get a more expensive original type window. This hitching post is still there on the west side of Summit Street. Anyone know of any other hitching posts in town? Do you? 320 Davenport Street. Is that right? Is that there yeah, yet? there's a hitching post there. Oh, I've got three. around it for 30 years. 320 <laughs> Davenport. <laughs> hey, that's neat. I'll, Karen, you may have seen that. I'll be there. Well, that's great. No one had come forth with an idea of that before. This is one of the original stone obelisk markers that they've added this plate to from 1839. You know, at the corner of Court, where Court tees in the summit. Well, I don't know. Probably commemorates the one of the corners of the original city. You know, I don't know the exact wording. Now you know this apartment, or a couple of apartment building, condo units, co-ops. Co-ops. Yeah. Co um, co I think. Well, here we have the summit. What was it called the summit? Maybe they still call it the summit. The summit co-op. Is that what they call it now? The co-op. Okay, it was. The first apartment building in Iowa City. It was built in 1916 on land owned by a medical doctor. I don't remember his name now, but. Titzel. What? Dr. Titzel. Oh yeah, Titzel. Yes. He created quite a stir evidently by putting this up. He's on the left side, opposite. Ah. 
amongst the stately mansions of the area. Irving Weber recalled hearing about the controversy when delivering newspapers as a 15 or 16 year old. Each, each <laughs> unit in the... was too high and didn't fit into the neighborhood. Probably. <laughs> well, yeah. Each unit in the building had a Murphy bed. I think we all here know what a Murphy bed is. Some, some young folks might know what a Murphy bed is, but I put a picture in for someone who perhaps doesn't know about a Murphy bed. I'm told that each unit also had a very nice oak buffet, a claw-footed bathtub, speaking tubes, you know what they might be? Kind of like a glorified can with a string, but just a tube mechanism of speaking and a connection to a central vacuum system. That's pretty neat. Since 1947, the residents have owned their own units. Is that what your understanding is, Wally? In 1983, it was put on the National Register. I don't know for sure, but that's what... Unlike a condo, Okay. And co-ops are fairly common out east. You just own a share in the whole building, ah. which makes it a little difficult sometimes to watch my house. Okay. Now, do you know the Lindsey Griffin Lance Mansion? The architect's famous. Parker Berry and Sullivan Studios. This one? No, no. no. Oh, the other. Yeah, the previous. According to Weber, this was built in 19, 1893. It's often been called the Gingerbread House. Weber said it was a barber mail order home, claiming that the plans and building materials were shipped from Knoxville, Tennessee. I couldn't find any evidence that the building materials would ship and only the plans, I don't know. Some of you are familiar with Lawrence LaFour's 1975 book called American Classic. I thought the gingerbread house was kind of a cool looking place before LaFour kind of burst my bubble when he wrote, quote, this house is madly eclectic, combining in random profusion 10 or 12 different schools of design mm -hmm. and very badly proportioned. It excites the fascination that often attaches to unselfconscious unself absurdity. Oh, that's that, that was his opinion of the building. Lawrence Lafour. He's got a kind of a big book about... <laughs> Taking a trip south to Burlington Street and then east, I'm gonna take you down Burlington toward Lucas Street. We have these two big sorority houses along the way. Here's Kappa Alpha Theta, 1928, Zeta Tau Alpha, 1925. Now we get to Lucas Street. Turning south on Lucas, we find that most of this down the railroad tracks appears to be student housing. Some of it rather run down, but also okay. some newer apartment buildings. Do you have one down there, Wally? Not there, no. I have to wonder how many delightful old homes were torn down to make way for some of these apartment buildings. It was pretty bad shape by the time they tore it. There's one of the newer apartment buildings. The, the lawn certainly has not been well kept here, and that's a bit ramshackle. Some more apartment buildings there. Okay, now we're going to come up Governor Street. We, we had to go down the railroad tracks, I guess, to move north on Governor. In the 600 block, we find this Universe City program house. Does anybody know about the Universe City program? Okay. It's part of the Universe City, U-N-I-V-E-R-C-I-T-Y, neighborhood partnership whereby Iowa City remodels homes, converting from multi to single family units, assisting buyers with down payments, perhaps offering some debt forgiveness. It began, what, about five years ago? And some 35 have now been finished, I think. It's like I ran out of paint on the right side. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, city has acquired and rehabilitated homes in designated neighborhoods surrounding the University of Iowa and downtown Iowa City, trying to keep a balance between multiple and single family occupancy homes, I guess. Okay, now here. Here's a, here's a Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church. That's quite a mouthful. 
the Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church. Built in 1868, that little part right here, I think the structure is from 1868. That's the, church, yeah. That's the old part of the church they've added to it in the back fairly recently. Have you been inside, Eddie? No, but I've been all but, around it. What's on it? What street is this? Governor, 411 Governor. It was, it was situated outside the original city limits because when the church was built, who was not allowed to own property within the city limits? Black people, African-American people. And women. <laughs> and here's another historical sign that talks about the church here. It's Iowa City's only historically black church. This house at 332 Governor was built in the 1850s or 60s. It reminds you a little bit of the old Capitol. It's one of the earliest in Longfellow. It's one of the university program homes. Now I'm gonna jump over to the corner of Summit and Court and move east on Court Street. Aha, okay. Most of you probably know it as the Grant Wood home the famous painter of American Gothic and so many other things, but that's what he's, he purchased this and lived the last years of his life here. He did. He did. I believe so. He lived, Grant Wood lived from 1891 to 1942, dying at the young age of 50, apparently of pancreatic cancer. He's born just east of Anamosa, Iowa. Lived in Cedar Rapids, finally at 1142 Court Street. A friend of mine used to mow his grass when he was a teenager. He apparently lived in the house Grant did from 1935 till his death in 1942. The current owner is attorney Jim Hayes. He's done a lot of work on the house. I was able to get a, a tour of it a few years ago. I was told that he purchased it, the lot that was, Karen, you told me, just west of this and had the house torn down to expand his grounds. And I think Jim's intent is to will it to one of the University of Iowa programs. Tom? Yes? He doesn't live there. Would you go back there? Okay. <coughs> I've seen other houses with the, the star or something on the surface. Oh, yeah. And that, was this house built before 1900? 1858. They put those, um, the star on the outside and then the pole. Uh, yeah, there was a front porch type thing on this before. <clears throat> I haven't got the old pictures to show you, but. Some don't even yeah. see the rod going all you, the way through the building. If you drive by there, you can see those stars. And you just yeah, yeah, right. The house he tore, it down, tore down to the west of him was lived in by Tony Colby of the Union. Mm. And it was a beautiful house. I was inside of it. It was a lovely house. Do you remember the house, Karen? I was never Which is I only remember that, that it was torn there. down, yeah. Well, it was constructed for Nicholas Oaks with an E-S instead of just K-S. There, there are families with both E-S and S in town now, right? Dean Oaks. Dean Oaks. We don't, I don't know. I don't know. But this Oaks was born in Bavaria in Germany in 1828, came to the U.S. as a one- or two-year-old. He learned the brick-making trade in Ohio and came to Iowa City in 1855. He apparently saw the potential in establishing his own brick factory in Iowa City after spotting the abundant high quality clay deposits here. So he, he bought about 30 acres of land. It's a pretty big chunk of the Longfellow neighborhood. And his factory was established in the area probably about where Longfellow School stands. Why is this large field just north of Longfellow School scalloped out into this bowl-like shape? Probably where they dug the clay out. Right. It's used as a playground. Do you remember what else it was used for one time? Yes. It was known as Schrader Field, a city high football field from 1923 to 48. Did you play on that field, Ed? Hmm. 
Well, here's Longfellow School. It was built starting at least in 1917. It was done in about then, along with three other schools in Iowa City. You know them, Henry Sabin, which will probably be, I don't know, it hasn't gone down yet, has it? But it's going to be coming down where the Iowa State Bank is, or Midwest One is creating a new shop. <laughs> yeah. And Horace Mann, that's still up there. And there, most of us don't know that there was a Kellogg Elementary built at the same time. Not in the same style, but it was over about where the VA hospital is. And it, it served the grade school people from the Chautauqua and Manville Heights series until it was replaced by the Lincoln School in 1926. And Kellogg was named for uh, apparently a lady opera singer, not from Iowa City. I don't know how they came about that. It wasn't the Kellogg serial people or anything like when that. Did they tear that down, Tom? That I don't remember. Well, before the 50s when the VA went in. I don't know. Or maybe not well before. This, you know, these little free libraries you've seen around all over the place, they keep sprouting up. The story I've heard that as a man in Hudson, Wisconsin, built a model of a one-room schoolhouse as a tribute to his mother, who was, who was a former school teacher who loved to read. He put the model up in his yard, announcing free books. He partnered with another man with the goal to build 2,510 little free libraries, as many as Carnegie had built, and then keep on going. They reached their goal in August of 2012. By January of last year, it's an est there were an estimated 15,000 worldwide. You can buy plans and build them and different things. I think, what, about 2010 we maybe had the first one. They haven't been here terribly long. They say take a book, return a book. And if you look at the left of it down below, you see a little house for dog treats. Yeah, I've taken a few books. I haven't left many yet. I better. Now we'll venture south on Clark Street from Court Street. We see a mix of very old homes with some newer ones. There are a few notable properties. The Mary Cauldron home at 602. Do you remember that that was used as a home for old ladies and retired, later mixed, uh, both male and female, elderly persons? It was bought by a family that's now using it as a private residence. Dates to around 1860. Pardon? Oh, is that a dot MD, I think. Yeah. Bowery Street, they did a great job of rebricking that back in, when was that done? Around 2009, I believe. And then do you know about this little place? It used to be a church. It was, we think, built as, it's on the corner of Seymour, be the northeast corner of Seymour and Clark, right down from the Longfellow School, which is on Seymour. Built in 1939, we think, later served as a worship space for the Latter-day Saints and a Methodist congregation, then converted to a school for the handicapped, had an elevator installed, known as the Nelson School, a yoga studio once occupied it, so lots of things. Oh, it was in the Room magazine a couple, three years ago. It did a beautiful remake inside the house. Now what about these two little all steel homes, the chiclet homes? <laughs> these are on Clark Street, right where Seymour comes in on the west side. Well, I give a talk on the Lustron homes, of which these are two examples. The concept was a brainchild of a Carl Strandland, who was quite the executive with uh, engineering abilities. Government gave him a lot of loan a lot of loans, which the, the project flopped finally, it only lasted a couple of years. But it's interesting, they delivered an entire home on one truck. 10 tons of steel, <laughs> over 3,300 parts and 4,000 nuts and bolts, all on one truck. They, they loaded them on, in reverse order, so the first off the back of the truck were the first used for the building project. That's the subject of a whole nother talk. Now here is an interesting house on the north end of Rundle Street. It's owned by Jeff Shabillion, a retired botany professor. I met him outside his house. He was a friendly fellow. 
I didn't know, I just kind of approached him and I said, it kind of reminds me of a house that Bilbo Baggins might live in. <laughs> and he just chuckled, so he didn't, wasn't offended. Who do you suppose built this house? <laughs> yes, sure did. And Jeff told me that uh, Moffat salvaged this round window from a factory. He's got it in the front. Can you see it in the, well, you can't, it's right behind there in the front of the house. But Moffat used some interesting materials, as we've already learned. And Jeff told me one, on a one Halloween, a little girl dressed like a witch came up toward his house. His parents urged her, go ahead, you can go up to the door. The little girl said, no, a real witch lives in there. <laughs> Well, here's a slide illustrating some of the points of interest that I've kind of, I've shown you that Longfellow has a, quite a vast and colorful history spanning more than a century and a half. And the narrowness of the Rundle edition plots imparts a feeling of less openness than the nearby East Iowa City area, but I think it's a little more homey. It just feels kind of neat when you go through there, each in its own way. It's had industry that's come and gone, major floods, home to a variety of interesting figures, including at least one famous one, Grant Wood. But the area should be, let's see, the area should continue to be important to the University of Iowa for its offer of rental properties for students, and it will continue to serve as a community for the greater non-student population. There's little, if any, potential for any further development there. And it's protected by the conservation and historic preservation areas, but I think there are a lot of people who are very proud of their neighborhood. I've heard a lot of people say with quite a bit of glee that they've, they really are proud to live there. Tom, who maintains that trail? Um, that goes into the new area? Yeah, that is really a neat trail. Must be city, I would suppose. City park. Yeah, oh, yeah there is, actually it's a little, to, just to the east of it is, it, it's named as a park, I guess. <sighs> I think so. You, know, you talk about sources that you need. I've used a lot of internet sources, a lot of individual people, but the internet provides such a wealth of information anymore. Going through some of those engineering things at the city and flood records and talking with a lot of people at the city, university professor. A project like this is never done because you don't reach an end point, you just keep learning more and more. But I think it's quite a fascinating area and enjoyed working with it. So thank you.